Hey guys, Modzy here, back with another video, and today I've got a slightly unscheduled entry into my GPU history series. You see, in my last video, we took a look at NVIDIA's revolutionary GeForce 3, and I mentioned in that video that we're going to be taking a look at ATI's mighty Radeon 9700 Pro next. But while trying to find a uh, 9700 Pro, I uh, stumbled across this other rather special card that I've been looking for for my collection for uh, a number of years, and uh, well, let's check it out. This is the Asus V8460 Ultra Deluxe, a GeForce 4 Ti4600. When I first laid eyes on this card back in 2002 in the Atomic MPC magazine, it was like looking at a poster of a Lamborghini Diablo GTR or a Ferrari F40. To me, this was the first time I looked at a piece of computer hardware as more than just chips on a PCB. This card looked stunning. Now I could never afford a $900 GPU back then being a student and all. So when I was looking to buy a new GPU around this time, everyone was telling me to go ATI, mostly because of how much better performance they were compared to the GeForce 4 cards. But I was blind with green envy, or purple in this case. So what was wrong with the GeForce 4 series of cards? Well, the GeForce 4 actually launched with outstanding performance when it launched in early 2002. It was a great evolutionary step up from the already powerful NV20 core. The revised core had improved and updated features along with faster clock speeds all round, and its performance was outstanding and Nvidia was back on top again. But sadly being just a revised core of the previous two generations, it still lacked DirectX 9 support. So at this time it was known that ATI was developing a brand new chip from the ground up and it was still unclear whether Nvidia should have also followed suit, but we had to wait almost half a year for the new chips to come out from ATI. So the core inside the flagship GeForce 4 Ti4600 has a core speed of 300MHz and a memory speed of 550MHz. Some board partners shipped slightly overclocked versions, although most of these had only simply overclocked the VRAM as the NV25 at reference was already pushing up against its architectural limits. Because of this, the lower clocked Ti4200 model was the real star of the GeForce 4 Ti lineup. It was a fully unlocked NV25 core just with slightly lower clock speeds and RAM speeds at almost half the cost of its bigger brother. This meant that it could almost always be overclocked to within 10 or 20 MHz of the TI4600. So given its stock that the TI4200 and TI4600 was only separated by a small increment in clock speeds, this meant that performance from the bottom end to the top end was actually very close, only separated sometimes in some games by very small margins. In my own testing between the two cards that I've got, this was actually also very noticeable. In fact, the XXX Millennium Silver Edition version of the TI4200 that I have comes slightly pre-overclocked by default as well, and it performs so close to the TI4600, I was a little bit surprised at just how close they actually were, 
given the massive price difference when these two cards were actually the current generation. To give you an idea on price, the Asus model card that I've got here, at some of the cheaper places you could find it, was around $900 to $950. Whereas the TI-4200 that I've got was somewhere in the neighbourhood of $450 to $480. Yet, between these two cards, there usually is about 5 to 10, maybe 15% performance between the two. That's a huge amount of cost for just such a very small amount of gain. So the main question I like to ask in these videos is, are these cards any good if you're planning to build a retro gaming system today? Well, this is rather simple this time around. The TI-4200 is really cheap and very easy to find on eBay and will usually give you between 90 to 95% of the performance of a TI-4600. A TI-4600 on the other hand goes for several hundreds of dollars, very hard to find in good condition, often has broken coolers or issues with the cooler in general, and they're just really not worth it unless you're a hardcore collector and want to just have the flagship card for the GeForce 4 in your collection. So if you're planning a Windows 98 or early Windows XP retro build, my recommendations are very similar to last time. Grabbing a TI-4200 if you want to go Team Green, or Radeon 9800 Pro if you want to go Team Red. However, if you do want to grab the flagship TI-4600 card, I do have a slight warning that comes from personal experience and from other stories of retro buyers and collectors of these cards. Given that these are AGP4X cards, drawing all their power through the PCB and the AG port directly, these cards had no external power connectors. This means that anyone who's running these cards for, with any kind of like long-term overclock often ended up burning out the VRMs on the cards or even sometimes killing their motherboard's AGP ports. So be careful when buying these cards used and make sure you research the cards getting high resolution, very clear photos of the PCBs, especially the backs, so you can see if there's any burning or scorching. So in summary, the GeForce 4 TI-4600 came with NVIDIA's updated Infinite FX2 engine, the same 4 pixel pipeline as the GeForce 3, and the product lineup for the GeForce 4 had limited performance gains going from the low tier to the high tier. By the time 2003 rolled around, the GeForce 4 TI4600 was so outdated and overwhelmed by the ATI cards that had launched a couple of months earlier, even the mid-range 9500 Pro from ATI was more than double the performance of the TI4600 in the newer games of that year. Luckily, there wasn't a huge number of DirectX 9 games at the start of 2003, so the TI-4600 was still holding its own against the 9500 Pro, however the 9700 just seemed untouchable for the TI-4600. So Nvidia had to do something radical, and as bad as it may have looked for Team Green with its fourth generation of GeForce cards, their next generation, the FX series, was unfortunately an utter disaster. This is a very interesting story, however, as it does involve 3D effects, but that's a story for another day. So I hope you've enjoyed this look back at the GeForce 4 TI cards. The two I've managed to pick up are real highlights in my collection, and are some of my favourite of the early generation of AGP era cards. And yes, I will be getting around to doing the FX series of cards, but I'll be waiting until I manage to get my hands on one of the more flagship versions of the cards to do a feature video on it. So I may end up actually skipping the FX series of cards just for now, as I do have several of the GeForce 6 series cards, and I'll come back to the FX series at a later date. So thanks for watching the video guys, it's been awesome fun taking a look back at these old Nvidia cards, it's for me been a real trip down memory lane. But I think it's about time we switched over to Team Ruby, so stay tuned and I'll catch you in the next one.